All right, everyone, we are back with a an exciting episode. We're going to be recapping uh, the Cassian Andor series that just wrapped up uh, last week, but we wanted to bring on a special guest to talk about it with us. Now, this is a guest we've had on before, but not since last, I think it was February, when the Book of Boba Fett ended, uh, but we're happy to have back with us today the Swedish Jedi, uh, Matilda. Thank you so much for coming back on. How have you been? Thank you so much. Um, I'm good. It's been a very busy fall. We had a great summer uh, with my friend from the U.S. visiting. So it's been a great time with Kenobi and stuff coming out. It's crazy Star Wars times for sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, since we had the uh, the Book of Boba Fett ended, we had the Kenobi series kind of over the the late spring, uh, early summer there. And then, yeah, Cassian Andor, which just uh, rattled off uh, a whole bunch of episodes of really good Star Wars television. Really excited about it. So, uh, Cassio, what do you think? Are you excited to talk about Andor? We did a little, we dipped into it a little bit just kind of after the, our first kind of initial impressions, but about the series overall, exciting stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think Andor is just high quality Star Wars. Like, I didn't have to hype myself up for it. It just was solid every week. So I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Cassia, you and I have talked, uh, like I said, a little bit about it. We did that kind of like intro reaction uh, sort of episode about it. We did an episode about Rogue One where we talked about uh, kind of our interest level in the Andor series, you know, back before it got started. But uh, Matilda, let's uh, let's throw it over to you. And this was announced, um, you know, Rogue One, uh, the film. What were kind of your overall thoughts of Rogue One? And were you excited for Andor when they uh, made the announcement for the series? Honestly, I was pretty lukewarm because Rogue One, although it is a good movie, is one of my least favorite Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it's just because of the fact that it's kind of dark. Everyone dies. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has high stakes. Um, so therefore, Andor was not an, a character that really intrigued me. Uh, but this has changed radically over the past 12 weeks. So mm -hmm. I've been turned <laughs> to the Andor side of things. Um, yeah, I've been, it's been a treat every single week. Like you said, Cassie, I fully agree. I don't have to, I don't have to kind of um, prepare myself for something cringy or bad or low quality or, or anything to come my way. It's just been solid all the way through. Yeah, for sure. That was um, one of the things that I kind of noticed um, here, and we'll talk kind of our general thoughts at the end. But yeah, it was something that I definitely looked forward to week to week, probably even more so than the other um, Star Wars series that we've that we've gotten. You know, as soon as you know one of these episodes would end, I'd start you know immediately counting down until the until the next Wednesday when the next one would would come out. So yeah, pretty exciting stuff and uh, really good. Uh, you know, TV, TV show just in general and uh, kind of a really good addition to uh, the Star Wars universe and definitely has a much different tone uh, than, you know, stuff that we've um, you know seen in Star Wars before, which I think is is kind of interesting. A more uh, quote unquote adult uh, Star Wars uh, story for sure. So just kind of interesting to see the way that the universe plays out uh, in something a little bit more high stakes and something a little bit more realistic, I think. For sure. Yeah. All right. So the way we thought we would uh, kind of structure this, if you if you were joined us with, you know, when we had the Swedish Jedi on to talk about the book of Boba Fett, we kind of went through uh, each individual uh, episode um, and broke those down a little bit more. But the way that this series was structured, it was based more kind of in that same Clone Wars thing where you had kind of these individual uh, sort of arcs that propelled the story forward. So what we thought we would do is we would kind of talk about the individual arcs um, that Cassian Andor was taking through these and then kind of on the periphery you have you know kind of the the forming rebel alliance side you know with mom Mothma and luthien and then you have kind of the uh you know the imperial uh formation side you know with uh cyril and uh deidre uh there so we thought we'd break these kind of down into arcs talk a little bit about you know what andor is getting up to um in these arcs what we thought about them and then you know kind of talk you know a little bit about the peripheral stuff that was going on there too but the show gets started off and we are uh meeting uh Cassie Nandor uh you know very very dark very bleak uh you know we talked a little bit about it you know kind of had like these blade runner type of vibes um uh, you know of Andorum Morlano one looking for his sister but then we're going back to kind of his home 
uh, planet or home base of a planet of Ferrix and getting introduced to the characters. So, uh, Cassia, let's start with you. So we get into kind of this first uh, arc of Andor um, in Ferrix. What were kind of your initial impressions? What did you think about the people that we met on Ferrix and how they were setting up the story, you know, both between kind of kind of what we're seeing on Ferrix and then also with the flashbacks of the young uh, Cassia uh, here? It was interesting to learn more about Cassian's or Cass's past. Uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, Peter Pan a bit. Uh, and just kind of like seeing Ferrix, it kind of seemed a bit like a, an England, I guess, like planet in <laughs> Star Wars. Which I guess makes sense because that's where uh, Andor was shot. And yeah. <laughs> uh, it just seemed like a good home base. The characters are interesting. They uh, have flaws. And uh, I would say it's been interesting to kind of see where their stories lead. Yeah, for sure. I thought, you know, it's uh, kind of an interesting setup. It's it's tricky, I guess, because we're introduced to the character of Cassian Andor. And, you know, us as Star Wars fans, we are very familiar with who, who this character is. But you still have to sort of build some sort of a backstory, who he is, how he got there, uh, those sorts of things. And you get introduced to some amazing characters. Uh, B2, who has this fun little bop as he's rolling down the street. Uh, really great stuff. But uh, Matoda, let's uh, toss it over to you. So we have this first kind of arc, the first three uh, episodes here. Uh, Casa, that would be me, and Reckoning. These ones are all directed by uh, Toby Haynes. Uh, what did you think getting started into this, and what were kind of maybe some of your, your favorite uh, character moments or uh, people that you liked or could identify with here on uh, Ferrix within uh, Andor's story? First impressions was the fact that it was so gritty. Um, it was dark. It feels like a world that's lived in and I loved the detail about um, the native kids, Casa and its friends, the fact that they were speaking a native language. Um, and we haven't seen this in Star Wars before, not to this extent. Of course, um, we see a lot of alien species speaking a different language, but I'm talking about humanoids, human, mm -hmm. humans speaking different languages. Usually it's just basic English. Um, and right here, we did not see that, and I loved it. I thought it was very refreshing to see that. Um, and also, you're saying it looked a lot like England on Ferrix, and I actually think that they are, their architecture reminds me a little bit of Spain for some reason. Mm. Um, I'm thinking of um, Salvador Dali in Barcelona. Um, that sort of architecture, it's very, it's very roundish. It doesn't have the square. Um, mm -hmm has a like, yeah. round lines instead. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was yeah, interesting that, too. Yeah, that rounded um, uh, kind of brick type of yeah. architecture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then as far as characters are concerned, I really liked Bix. And I can't remember the, her boyfriend's name um, who died. Tim, Tim. Yeah, Tim. Um, that was a very... It was an interesting relationship. Um, and the kind of tension and her history with and or you you suspected something had been going on between those two in the past um, mm -hmm. it was yeah I love the um, the shop that she's working in um, it just looks so real I love the realism that we were introduced to that just continued throughout the whole series yeah for sure there is definitely a level of realism to the show like it felt very much like a place that you could go to and i mean quite literally you can you can go to a lot of these yeah. these places if you if you look them up online but you know it, it felt like a place you could journey to you know even more so than you know tatooine or some of the more fantastical um you know <laughs> futuristic uh, space type things that we'd uh, seen a little bit you know in the the Mandalorian and stuff like that so yeah yeah definitely had this uh, level of realism to it and i really liked the way that um, the story was kind of structured and here in this first piece we're kind of seeing you know just basically what it feels like for you know the people as this you know giant oppressor is is starting to come down on you you're kind of going about your business um but there's kind of this this constant nag and and threat kind of in the shadows but you figure you know as long as you keep your head down you keep moving forward you don't 
uh, stir up any trouble. You know, everything's going to be fine, right? Um, it's uh, what Generoso says, you know, it's only a problem uh, if you look up. So, you know, you just are, you're going to work, you're going about your business, and you're trying to stay out of trouble. But, uh, you know, there are some some seeds of things uh, starting to begin. And, you know, yeah. Bix is one of those characters who's, you know, kind of doing that, making making some contacts, you know, figuring out uh, <laughs> what can be done. Um, and we're introduced then to uh, Luthien, uh, who uh, is excellent and kind of the way that he's trying to kick this off. And um, I'm off Ma's character at this point, who is still very much uh, a senator here, um, as we're seeing her um, in this first arc. So uh, Luthien and Ma Mothma, let's throw it over to the rebel side here for this arc. Uh, Cassio, we're introduced reintroduced to Mom Mothma. Uh, pretty awesome stuff. Uh, what do you think about the Rebel Alliance uh, here, kind of, as we're getting the story kicked off? Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of like on the down low. It's not the full-fledged Rebel Alliance that we see in the original trilogy. It's kind of like a baby alliance, and we kind of have to uh, see it uh, from the very beginning. Yeah, and I really like that. And you have kind of the different ideologies, right, of uh, Luthien and, and Ma Mothma. One is a little bit more militant, ready to ramp things up. Ma Mothma is still kind of believing in, you know, democracy. And we'll see her in the in the Senate chambers. But uh, Matilda, uh, the blossoming Rebel Alliance, as we're getting the, the show started off. Uh, what did you think about uh, them, those characters, and the way that was set up with uh, Luthien and Ma Mothma and... Uh, kind of this uh, antique dealer uh, sort of front. What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, I thought it was like brilliant. Um, and I just, I can't help thinking about the aesthetic details um, in Luthen's shop, um, all the little Easter eggs thrown in. Loved and it. his, yeah, and his um, sidekick, what's her name? Um, ooh, what's her name? Clea. Clea. Uh, she's, yeah. a, she's an interesting character for sure. Um, and also Monopma and her driver, who is, who is definitely suspicious from the start, and we find out that he is indeed a double agent trying to spy on them. Um, so, and kind of the, the tension that she's living, she's in, middle, she's in the middle of this, something that is starting to boil, starting, something is starting to happen, and she's like at the center of it, um, and like she says, um, if they're found out, she's the first one to go down, so she knows the stakes, but yet she keeps on doing what is right, keeps fighting for what is right, but she's trying to do it cautiously um, because she doesn't want to put people's lives on the line. Um, but we see that, like you said, Luthen thinks differently, and that is an interesting, do you say juxtaposition? Like the. The, diff mm -hmm. the different extremes is very fascinating to watch. They're dynamic together um, and how it changes over the series as well. Um, as we find out more about what's going on inside their heads, the motivations mm -hmm. further on. Yeah, for sure. Um, because, you know, my mom was a, a senator, a politician, so she's trying to, you know, sort of deal with this, you know, politically um, as Luthen's going about it a little bit more. I want to say militantly, but, uh, you know, a very much uh, a more uh, aggressive approach. So I really hope maybe in, in the second season or we get some background information, it would be kind of interesting to see what Luthen's kind of background was leading him up to this because we're it, we're reintroduced to Saw Gerrera. We kind of know um, his upbringing, but, you know, to get a little bit of backstory on him, I think would be would be really interesting. And, yeah, I think that's that's a great way to play it off. Mom Mothma uh, is without allies. She has... Uh, <laughs> A, a jerk of a husband uh parent yeah. and her daughter is is very much uh you know kind of pitted against her uh by him and we're you know going to kind of go through their relationship as the the story progresses um actually um then on the flip side of that we have uh Deidre, uh a rising star in the uh in the ISB, and we have uh, Cyril Karn, who is the uh, the creepiest guy around, who uh, likens himself as a rising star, but but not really. It's it's kind of the same thing uh, for him as you know the people on Ferrix, right? You just just keep your da head down, don't <laughs> don't stir up any trouble, you know you know. But but Cyril is is a real go getter, um, I guess here from the start, and uh, Andor really gets under his skin um, and causes him to lose a lot, which is going to send him on this trajectory. So uh, Cassio on the flip side of that we talked about the the kind of the budding rebel alliance uh the budding 
uh, Imperial uh, officers here. Uh, what did we think about, about those two, about the way that the ISB has been set up? Uh, what did you think about all that stuff? It is interesting to see as the Rebel Alliance light rises, uh, the Imperial response kind of also rises and becomes more, uh, I guess, manifest uh, to to us as an audience. And it's just kind of interesting. Uh, it reminds me of the sequel trilogy, like darkness rises and light to meet it. And here we kind of see light rise and darkness to meet it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting, though, because these characters, it's like they think they're doing what's right. Like Cyril thinks he's doing what's right. Deidre thinks she's doing what's right. Uh, but Cyril, like... I don't know. It's it's interesting because it's almost like he's kind of like a, a a dark mirror of uh, Cassian in my view, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Cassian is kind of like the hero, um, not at the forefront, but kind of behind the scenes. And I think Cyril likes to see himself more like at the front of the scenes. He kind of like envisions himself more at the the front of the scenes but uh he just needs to learn to be okay with being at the at the background you know helping people you know and maybe not hyper fixate as much on things so that's that's kind of what i thought yeah you bring up an interesting point that they're kind of a, a mirror image of it and the show does a really good job of kind of leaving us you know, at the end of this first arc, really wondering what kind of a character Cyril is going to be, um, because we know that he's very ambitious, kind of, and you know, preserving uh, order in the in uh, his small slice of the galaxy there, which you know ultimately kind of cost him his job for going uh, above his uh, station, so to speak. And and you don't know if that's going to you know kind of kind of flip him, leave him with a bad taste in his mouth for the empire or if he's really going to double down on it and as we see uh the story play out you know he's definitely uh going to uh, double down on it but uh matilda let's uh, toss it over to you then so the uh, sort of beginning of the way that the empire is going to be structured as we get into uh you know kind of our original trilogy timeline what did you think about uh deidre and cyril and uh the way that uh this thing's getting started off first i need to add that i think that we could probably call luthan like an extremist um, okay. As opposed to Mom Afma, who's like the mediator. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, when it comes to Cyril Karn, I think um, the humiliation on Ferrix is a very interesting way to start off with um, with a uh, imperial character. Because, um, like you said, he is he's going for justice. He's trying to exact justi justice, and what he does, he thinks is right. And in a sense. Uh, in those first three episodes, I kind of rooted for him, I must I must say, um, in a different way that I did later on, um, because he didn't seem as, you know, inherently evil, uh, driven mm -hmm. by evil, driven by a force for doing bad things, or for, um, as opposed to Deidre, who is definitely a, a character that doesn't shy down on using any means possible to achieve her goals, to get what she wants. She is very ambitious. So when you can compare those two, she's definitely, definitely the most ruthless one. And uh, Cyril still, to me in the beginning, has some of a heart. He has something of a con conscience still. Um, but yeah, they are very, very interesting. They're not the stereotypical characters um, mm -hmm. that you feel are 100% evil. It's obvious that they're so evil. But rather you see the humanity, the fact that, yeah, you may be right about this, actually. But then you're using it for the wrong purposes. Uh, you have the right motivations, but you're serving the wrong master, so to speak. 
that is a really good point and you do sort of root for um you know both Cyril and Deidre at the beginning you know as they're kind of not being taken seriously and you're like oh you know <laughs> as the viewer you're like yeah something is going on you should you should be listening to these two yeah. and you know as as the story progresses you know ultimately you realize that you know you know kind of these two are are, are as bad as everyone else and you know it, it's just kind of interesting how like the wave of that like realization uh, comes over you you which is you know just a, a testament to how great the the script writing was to make yeah. you feel to feel that way about you know these two characters who ultimately are are pretty bad news for sure so um yeah just uh just kudos to that and that's that's kind of where uh we get left off here at the at the first section and then uh you know luckily uh andor is able to uh make it off of Ferrix uh uh with the aid of luthan um and basically gets recruited as kind of you know a key part of the next mission which is going to set up our next uh story arc here on all so uh as we as we mentioned and yeah you you said it very well there matilda luthan is kind of this extremist and uh you know rebellions aren't cheap you need money and that's uh what this is uh, setting us up to do this this mission on Aldani to steal, you know, just literal <laughs> literal credits from from the Empire here at this uh, kind of stronghold that they have. So we're getting to Aldani. We're meeting some some new characters. Uh, you know, we're meeting Senta and Vel. Uh, we're meeting uh, Nemec uh, and his very infamous now, at least in the Star Wars world, uh, Nemec's uh, manifesto. Uh, Skeen, uh, who's excellent, and then uh, Terramin. Uh, here kind of at this encampment as we're going on the Aldani mission. So, Cassia, uh, let's go to you. We're on to our next uh, kind of section here now. Um, it's a little bit more. I don't want it. The, the tension really is kind of starting to to ramp up here as we're going out of the first one into the second one, and you're starting to see kind of real stakes for people and people now that are, that are actually, you know, doing something, fighting back, uh, so to speak. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, Aldani and the characters we meet there? Aldani, it kind of re- reminds me of the Iceland of uh, the Star Wars galaxy. And when I think of Andor, I think of the Aldani uh, sections the most, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just is kind of an interesting, like, very grassroots rebel alliance. Uh, and it's just kind of interesting to see... Uh, Cassian at the beginning of his um I guess like time as a rebel you -hmm. know and just the conclusion of the Aldani sequences is is beautiful and stunning I thought uh, with the I guess the stars you know yeah, the uh, the eye there and kind of this uh, this shooting star uh, sort of thing. Yeah, it it is very interesting because we're we're getting there. Like I mentioned, you know, we're meeting people now who are, uh, you know, all, you know, boots on the ground sort of thing. Really, actually, uh, doing something for the Rebel Alliance. And Cassian is just kind of, you know, dropped in there as more of this uh, mercenary type. You know, Luthen kind of sees his his natural skills and talents for getting into places that uh, he probably doesn't belong and you know uh, Luthen's willing to take that chance on him you know if this works great if it doesn't work then you know not really any uh, skin off his back so to speak um, you know with Andor but I thought that it was really interesting and this arc um, like I said is uh, these three parts so we have Aldani the Axe Forgets and the Eye uh, all directed by Susanna White um, but but really interesting uh, stuff here so Matilda let's uh, toss it over uh, to you, and I actually want to um, kind of uh, uh, dial this back just just a touch uh, for you because I'm interested to know what you um, have to say about it. So uh, we're we're getting him kind of into to boots on the ground, and when we're when we're leaving barracks, uh, Cassian has kind of this final encounter with his adopted mother uh, Marva there, um, you know, and kind of her ideologies and his and uh, the way that they're not quite overlapping yet, and I think that when he gets there he's starting to to kind of see things through the way that she was seeing things a little bit more um so i guess uh matoto what are kind of your your thoughts on on that the ideology there uh with marva because i think that she's a really pivotal uh character in this story uh, but then on to um aldani just in general what were kind of some of your thoughts there uh, any of the the characters or situations really stand out to you i think that Deep down, Andor knows that he needs to fight, uh, but he has built up this wall, and 
people are starting, different characters are starting to chip away at the wall, like his mother and Nemec and his manifesto. People are, start, are starting to influence him in different ways, subtly, and I just love that, um, his reluctance and how he's on, on this journey. Um, it's not a straight journey either. You Somehow you expected him to become more of a verbal by the end of the Eldani arc, but I would say that he wasn't the rebel that we see later on at that point, but rather he kind of regressed even a little bit in my, in my, in my mind when he let down his fellow colleagues for the heist and took his money and left. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, I just love the suspense that was built up in this, these episodes, um, the slow pacing, which gave us time to appreciate the characters and get to know Nemec, and Termin, and Sinta, Ski, and Sarf Vel. And uh, I feel like every single character, we could make a standalone project for every one of them because they have an interesting enough story to, as a starting point. Uh, that is rare in projects like these, that you feel that way. But I mm -hmm. felt like I want to know what motivates these people, what kind of backstory they have, and why they're here today. We know a little bit about Cassian, obviously, and his journey from his home planet, which was polluted by the Empire, destroyed. Um, but we don't know about these people, and I would love to see more backstories later on. And I also loved the whole um, story about the Eldani natives going to see the eye for their the sort of uh, festivity um, occasion. It was a very beautiful inclusion of these native clothes, the natives singing, and it's just it just added so much authenticity to the story. I felt like. It reminded me a little bit of a combination between Native Americans, I guess, but it was like mixed with the Samis in Northern mm -hmm. Sweden, Northern Scandinavia. And mm -hmm. that's what the, those clothes, like, that's the kind of vibe that I got from the, their clothes. I thought, I thought that was interesting for sure. Yeah, it definitely, it was interesting and there were a lot of um, you know, as you just mentioned, a lot of real world world parallels is, you know, the Empire have have driven this native people out of their uh, out of their homelands and, you know, yeah. further away. And uh, you get the I don't remember the, the name of the, the characters there, the Imperial officers who were, were coming in for the the tour, basically, for, yeah. for the day. We're talking about, you know, yeah, we'll just, you know, we set up places for them to eat and drink on the way. And then they forget yeah. about how <laughs> about the terrible things that we did. And, you know, that's that's a lot of parallels to our yeah. own, own real world. And, you know, there's there's countless parallels through uh, throughout the show with the with the real world. And, yeah, you know, of course, there's there's going to be a lot that that we miss. We could definitely uh, dissect uh, all sorts of things there. But, yeah, that's that's a really great one. And, you know, kind of kind of the way that you know it it set up this this small little tiny rebel cell against the empire you mm -hmm. know kind of at the at the backdrop of of this thing that is you know so spiritually uh significant to the people of this planet that they've um the empire has taken over uh basically is is really fascinating um and and really great and that's uh that's one of the the great things one of my favorite things about this whole uh series was the line that comes from uh, episode number five which is the uh title of the the episode the axe forgets yeah. right the the tree remembers yes. but the axe forgets and you know the the axe does forget and that's kind of a recurring theme um and especially then as we get into you know hearing kind of the final final bits of the the manifesto is that you know the the empire is it's too big it's ultimately it's it's very weak and it has a lot of cracks because it's unnatural um and i think that that is a uh, really neat uh kind of sentiment and a really a uh, neat kind of theme that as you go back and rewatch the show, you'll be able to pick up on, on those things on uh, repeat viewings, which I think is really cool. Definitely. I just love, again, the elements of uh, real-world things like native people, native languages, native singing, which really um, it transports you into this universe in a way that I haven't felt before I feel like this Star Wars universe is much closer to our world than mm -hmm. 
what we've seen otherwise with these fantastical uh, f stories about the forest and about, you know, the super supernatural elements of things. Um, this feels more down to earth and I like it. I really like it. I appreciate it so much. Um, um, and of course, you know, Aldani, the, the heist is a success, but not without its its loss. You know, unfortunately, uh, Nemec uh, loses his life uh, in the in the escape uh, kind of there in the aftermath uh, with, you know, him telling uh, Andor to climb, which, of, of course, you know, harkens back to uh, K2 uh, saying those same things. It's uh, very sad, very emotional um, and very uh, kind of traumatic as as we're getting off of there. And, you know, kind of this close knit uh, group of people who. Um, you know, uh, lose members of the party, uh, have, you know, one of the members of the party, you know, kind of turn on them and you don't ever really get a full grasp on, you know, what, you know, their motivations were and stuff like that. So it's just really fascinating to kind of see, um, you know, especially at the birth of something, uh, like the rebel Alliance would have been, you'd have a lot of people that were coming into it from, you know, all sorts of angles, right? It wasn't necessarily just that the, the empire was this big oppressing thing, but you'd have people that were, uh, doing it for more, you know, mercenary type of things or to, uh, you know, to uh, get money out of it or to, to stick it in the eye of the empire as, uh, Luthen says, or, you know, to just try to restore, you know, some sort of political balance. And I think that all of that stuff is very fascinating. And I think that a lot of it, uh, comes to the head here. Um, in Aldani. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have something bad news like Aldani happened, the Empire is going to, uh, you know, try to uh, put their foot down a little bit more. Uh, they have uh, basically issued a decree that says uh, any sort of activity that could be seen as anti-imperial, uh, we're going to just uh, jack up the uh, sentencing, uh, really, really start to come down on these, which is uh, definitely something we have parallels with here um, in the real world, and that's going to ultimately uh, get and or in trouble as you get kind of this little breather of an episode, right, the announcement where they're they're starting to do that. They're starting to, to kind of round up people. And then you have kind of this weird crossroads where uh, Deidre and Cyril are uh, deciding how important uh, finding Cassie and Andor is. And uh, you have, you know, Deidre and Luthen and um, Amathma and they're uh, kind of piecing out how important uh, <laughs> the direction that the, the forming Rebel Alliance is going to go. Um, and that ultimately lands uh, our dear Cassie and Andor in prison so uh just take a, a quick little break uh cassia the announcement uh what were your thoughts kind of about the way that this was structured kind of this little drop-in episode before we get back to our our arcs uh any real world parallels that you saw or things that you thought were important here as we go on to kind of our second half of the andor series the prison episodes were i think some of the most uh political uh, episodes I've seen of Star Wars and I, I liked that they weren't shying away from real world parallels like they weren't even able to keep their shoes you know going to uh, the prison and just kind of seeing how it's set up like uh a game, you know, like there's more prisoners than there are guards. The competitions keep them disunited, you know. They could be stronger together, but because they're forced into a competition and it's revealed that they're making parts of the the Death Star, you know, like mm -hmm. it it just is sad that uh they could have united sooner, but they're trapped in this this little game yeah for sure yeah and that's going way back you know to the the second world war that was you know kind of the the strategy you imprison uh these people and then you uh basically make them work and then they're they're too tired to uh you know sort of uh unionize themselves or too fi tired to fight back um and they, they don't have the time to do that so uh, matilda let's uh toss this over to you so we had we had the announcement which was directed by benjamin karen and then yeah we were on our way to uh prison uh with andor for the uh terrible crime of uh walking along the the beach there which is uh too much for the empire uh these days so we have narkina five uh nobody's listening and one way out it's all directed by toby haynes but uh what do you think uh matilda kind of kind of that first episode the announcement uh the empire is starting to clamp down uh you know and kind of as these streams are are 
uh, mingling, I guess, and then uh, getting set off to to the prison planet. What did you think about that? What did you think about uh, who we met there, and what do you think is important uh, that Cassian Andor learns um, kind of in this uh, third act of his story here? First of all, I thought of, all of a sudden, Guantanamo Bay. That's okay. the two words that came into my head. And similar similar prisons uh, where people are just tossed in, being suspected for something on loose grounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, you were talking about the World War, uh, Jews and homosexuals, vice versa, or, being sent to these camps, these war camps, and um, it's really these episodes are kind of sickening. They're not comfortable to watch at all. Mm-hmm. I re- they really touch me on a deep level. Um, it made me think about what kind of society do we actually want? Do we want a police society where people are hunted down? Uh, for minor crimes, or do we want to create a society society where we will help people that are at the bottom of the chain to get up? Um, it's seriously really that kind of question that is provoked in my head. Um, and considering the fact that we have a lot of kind of racist forces moving in my con- country right now, um, it touches me on a deep level, definitely. Mm-hmm. And um, Andy Circus, my lord, Andy Circus. <laughs> I good, am such a fan of his. I was squealing when I saw him. And he was just magnificent in this role. Um, he gave like his full force, his facial expressions, his voice. It was just mind-blowing. Um, and like you said, the tension that is going on between the prison prisoners um, uh, they're being stripped of everything, their shoes, their morals, their will to live, like the guy who committed suicide on the floors, um, mm-hmm. their lives, uh, thinking of Olaf, who finally died from a stroke, uh, working himself to death. Um, side note, my grandfather was tossed into a work camp during the Second World War. Um, he almost died working there as a te- teenager. Uh, so it really resonates with me, um, the story. And I just, I just love the fact that uh, the showrunners dare to take this show to this extreme, to show us how dark the Empire really is, what uh, methods they're ready to use, uh, like Dedra, who is uh, Deidre, who's uh, torturing begs to the sound of dying children mm-hmm. um it is really it really leaves you with a sour taste in your mouth afterwards uh, it makes you it makes you really it, it, you, it makes you think it makes you think a lot and reflect on what is going on around us right now um so yeah very impactful episodes both like emotionally and mentally for me yeah absolutely absolutely um and it does get you know very very uncomfortable to watch and it is very uh you know kind of kind of important and telling stuff you know we've we've made kind of some some parallels there to to real world examples where you know sort of this thing was was drawn from it also kind of drew on a lot of uh inspiration from George Lucas and THX 1138 you get kind of some some of the same sort of theming and uh you know the way that the episodes uh looked and stuff like that but yeah it's it's just very it's very uncomfortable you know to to see someone uh, in prison uh you know falsely and you know put into this uh labor camp type of type of a thing and meanwhile you have the the empire you you mentioned I'm glad you brought it up uh Deidre you know kind of using these uh torturous techniques uh with with a doctor you know in the in the name of science for the empire uh so to speak uh torching there on the outside and uh meanwhile on, on the rebel alliance side you have you know Mom Mothma who's you know still trying to I think 
I think it's sort of dawning on her. Uh, now, I don't remember exactly the episode where she's speaking in front of the Senate and you just see kind of all of the pods are just turning their lights off and leaving because they couldn't be bothered to listen to anything that she has to has to say. But I think it's starting to dawn on her, um, you know, kind of how how serious things are getting and uh, how serious things are going to be, uh, you know, be getting for her. And you also have, you know, Luthen, who's there as as more of this extremist type of a figure saying all right you know things are going exactly the way i planned i you know want the empire to lash out and that's really going to get people up and up in a stir because if you don't you know if people don't feel the effects of this uh, fascist regime you know you just you ignore it it doesn't you know it doesn't bother you it doesn't affect you until it does so um he's trying to you know sort of uh start start a start a fire i guess and you know from from his angle then um it's starting to work as we're seeing him and you know try, starting to get these first interactions with saw Guerrero, who we know is another uh you know kind of political extremist on uh in the the terms of the uh, rebel alliance side but yeah seeing the stuff at at the prison i thought was just uh, it was it was heartbreaking but uh it was it was excellent to watch on you know a lot of levels because yeah Andy Circus is there and uh just absolutely um you know incredible given it his all um and his performance and you know I can't wait to see uh what he's got coming next uh he's uh, going back to uh Plan of the Apes which I'm very excited about so hopefully uh that and get to see a lot more uh, live action stuff with him in the future too because he's just absolutely um incredible in the kind of the way that he's you know really really focused on uh trying to get out of there and as the realization creeps in that you know no one is really getting out of there because all these people are are expendable it's it's just fascinating and then ultimately you get uh this really crushing sort of end to it with the the prison break and uh it gets out and uh you know uh looks at andor and says uh, that he can't swim uh yeah. which is which is which is crushing and and i i think at least in my own head too you know he probably knew you know starting this revolution the whole time you know they all know that they're out in the middle of the ocean so he knows the whole time that he's not going to really be able to escape but decides to lead uh this prison break anyway uh, which i think is is just fantastic so uh cassie any uh kind of other thoughts here on on the uh the prison section before we uh move on to the our uh, our kind of final arc here yeah, I, I like what you guys both said, uh, that the prison sequences uh, really reflect dark past and present uh, real-world parallels. Uh, and uh, it was some of the most heartbreaking uh, instances that I I've seen in Star Wars, you know, and um uh just kind of having to watch it like the empire never really seemed as dark like uh the empire isn't good and uh kind of escaping from the prison uh, it kind of makes we feel it with Cassie and like he's kind of coming home again, you know, but it's kind of like the Odyssey, like things have changed. His, his mother's dead. Uh, there's a funeral. The empire is kind of more in charge and it's kind of like B2 emo is the dog that survives and kind of just like is on its last leg when Odysseus returns and, um that's that's kind of what i i thought what about you guys yeah for sure absolutely it's it's kind of this uh penultimate moment i guess for andor to uh get out of this prison because it's it's really started to settle in on him at least from the standpoint of what the empire is doing what they're willing to do and how disposable uh, people have become to them, you know, in their uh, quest for ultimate uh, power and uh, resource uh, harvesting, I guess, so to speak. And yeah, it gets us set up into our final arc for uh, Cassidy Andor uh, as we return to Ferrix uh, with the daughters of Ferrix and Rick's Road, both directed by Benjamin Karen, uh, who maybe is my favorite director uh, ever now. I don't know for sure, but uh, Matilda, let's uh, let's start with you. So so we get out of out of the prison any kind of closing thoughts on the prison or where you think Cassie and Andor was uh kind of emotionally mentally um in terms of how he felt about 
uh, the Rebel Alliance and really starting to do something. And then uh, let's uh, get into this uh, final arc a little bit. You know, what are uh, I mean, there's nothing really to like because it's all very sad, but there are some things that are absolutely <laughs> beautiful and breathtaking. But uh, take it away. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I just think that Cassian finally begins to understand um, the stakes of the Rebel Alliance and also the the, um, the bigger picture of things. He has lived in his own world on Ferrix, doing small crime, and all of, all of a sudden he realizes um, how evil the Empire actually is, how bad, how destructive it is for the galaxy, how it treats its citizens with contempt, uh, people being, like you said, expendable and uh, it, it changes him. I think it's a very cathartic experience when, where he goes from being a denier of uh, the need for a rebellion uh, to a point where he realizes everyone needs to know what the Empire is capable of. Um, and I think that is a very good starting point for him to be propelled into his future as a part of the rebellion. Um, he's always, I think he's always going to think back on his experience, uh, the losses, the sacrifices made on Narkina 5. And, you know, whenever, whenever he might be in doubt of, of, um, of why he's in why he's a part of the rebellion. I think he's gonna think back, yeah, this is why. Um, and uh, I think if we're gonna talk about um, Mon Mothma a little bit, mm -hmm. I think her story in these episodes is really interesting. I think she's really beginning to understand that in order to serve the rebellion, she has to sacrifice everything. And by everything, that is literally everything. Um, her safety, her marriage, her f and her family, and her daughter. And um, I think it is, it is hard to see her struggle. She wants to make the right decisions for, for the sake of her family. But then she also wants to make the right decisions for the sake of the rebellion. Uh, because it, ultimately... Uh, the rebellion is going to serve her family in the future. Um, so I, it's heartbreaking as a mother, seeing her have to sacrifice, having to sacrifice her daughter for the sake of the rebellion. Oh man, I just couldn't imagine myself being in that position. Um, it is, it is really touching for sure. Um, yeah, what did you think about Mom Mothma and her story? Yeah, I thought that her arc was, you know, as as interesting and almost as paralleled to uh, Cassie Andor's, uh, you know, as you can get, really, because, you know, we'd mentioned it a little bit kind of at, at the outset, you know, she is a, the senator, the politician, and she's trying to do things, you know, <laughs> the way that she knows, right, through, through politics, through trying to get everyone, you know, kind of on the same page and to compromise. And, you know, as as it's kind of dawning on her throughout the course of the series that, you know, in this time of the, uh, the empire, there is no room for compromise it, again, which is very much, yeah. you know, kind of a, uh, parallel to our, our real world here. And those cracks are starting to sink in and, and you're seeing her, you know, sort of starting to dawn on her that, you know, if, if she keeps this up, you know, she's definitely going to be under a microscope from, uh, from the rest rest of the Senate to the Empire, you know, is the Senate even uh, functioning at all at this point? And, you know, as those cracks start to form and she's starting to grapple with the, you know, the decisions that she's going to have to make, the deals that she's going to have to make, you know, the, the implications for, um, like you mentioned, Matilda, her daughter, um, her family, um, and, you know, what she's willing to, to sacrifice um, in, in the name of, you know, fighting back against this oppressor and i i really liked um kind of by the very end of this um you know kind of a big theme through this is uh mamathma's money problem 
Um, and yeah. she's been trying to kind of fund, uh, you know, this this little small rebel alliance as, as good as she can. You know, obviously she she's coming from some money and has access to it. But as you know, the the spotlight, the magnifying glass are are moving in on these people who are not, you know, <laughs> lining up with uh, the way the Empire wants to to do their business. She realizes that that's going to be a problem. And you kind of see uh, this really neat uh, switch uh, kind of in her um, at the very end. She's in the car uh, with Perrin and she decides to, you know, take matters kind of into her own hand and, you know, creates yeah. this sort of uh, false narrative of, you know, yeah. Perrin's uh, gambling problem. And she, I think at that point, she's kind of, just, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> throw him under the bus, <laughs> which, which is great. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally, totally throw this guy under the bus. But, but you can just see kind of the wheels turning in her and she does uh, kind of this neat thing. She gets in the car and she takes off like her earrings and she like unclips her uh, kind of like shawl sort of thing that she's, that she's wearing almost like she's, you know, like, taking off the mask of Mom Mothma kind of in that yeah. moment and turning into uh, the Mom Mothma that we know who's leading mm -hmm. the, the Rebel Alliance, but, you know, taking this more sort of assertive role, you know, not to the extremes of Luthen um, at this point, but, you know, she has, she has things, you know, that aren't, aren't ships and weapons and uh, willing to, you know, go blow things up, but she has this brain that can manipulate people. And I think that those things are starting to come together for her. And I, I thought that it was awesome um, in sort of this kind of really neat, subtle way that the show just did, you know, every week. And it was exceptional, but that was kind of what I thought about uh, Mom Mothma's arc. Uh, Cassia, let's, uh, let's throw it over to you. Uh, Perrin, uh, not, not the best guy. What do you think about the, their relationship, her relationship with their daughter and just kind of her uh, general uh, kind of story arc here. It's a very traditional um, society that they have on Chandrilla. Um, and you can kind of just see that uh, Mon Mothma and Perrin are just very ill suited to each other. And, like, I don't kind of think even when they were young like I don't think they meshed well you know and it's just kind of sad that Mon Mothma is just busy with the with the senate and uh, the rebellion and just doesn't have time to take her daughter under her wing that's mm -hmm. kind of the impression I yeah. got and so her daughter um, I believe her name is Lita. Um, yeah. Gets kind of taken in by this very, very traditional belief structure, I guess. And, uh, I mean, they get together and they they have, like, a certain way they have to dress. And kind of just, like, when they were chanting and saying, like, the old ways are the best, I was like, oh... Wow. Oh um, I think it's a cult, you know, and mm -hmm. um, it, it's just kind of sad that uh, Lita's probably going to get drawn into a, an unhappy marriage, and I kind of hope that doesn't happen in season two. Yeah, for sure. It'll be interesting to see, I guess, how much of of that story carries on because we do know that there's going to be a little bit of a time jump I think as the second season uh gets underway so I guess we'll um have to pick back up uh with that there um we talked a little bit about Mon Mothma's uh kind of character arc um Matilda let's uh let's go back over over to the other side then before we kind of kind of wrap up uh the final arc for Cassie Dandor uh Deidre Cyril um the way the Empire is structured here kind of at the end um you know that imperial shuttle comes down she steps off of it but what do you think about about their arcs i guess overall throughout the story yeah i think deidre is definitely humiliated when she understands when she's literally thrown to the ground uh dragged away and then cyril saves her um i think she understands she thought she she saw him as some kind of you know useless pawn in a game but actually, she might find him more useful than she initially thought. And I find that really interesting. Because um, she, is, she is pretty haughty. She's pretty proud of herself. Um, thinking that she has the best resources at her hands. Um, and that no one can stop her. But she is surely shown that this is not the case. And I, 
I believe it's going to affect her later on in her in her arc for season two, and also the fact that Cyril is getting his his big break, I would say, or a chance of getting back his um, what do you call it um, his comeback um, mm -hmm. prestige, seemingly prestige. Yeah, I think that's going to affect him too. Uh, well, he, when he's gonna maybe probably leave the, his humiliation on Ferrix behind and move on um, as an imperial servant. Um, yeah, what did you think? Yeah, I think that their um, sort of dynamic is really interesting. You know, I mentioned it a little bit uh, with with Cyril, and you don't really kind of know how he's going to to fare once he gets fired and he goes back to uh, yeah. Coruscant to to eat cereal and hang out with his uh <laughs> his, his very judgment his ju very judgmental mom um you don't kind of know what way his story is going to go but you know it kind of kind of leaves you with him fixating on that image of uh cassian andor and then uh you know he keeps trying to insert himself into uh deidre's uh inner circle which yeah. you know is uh, i don't know on one on one hand you know it feels like she's very annoyed by it but i she definitely could have like stamped that out anytime that yeah. <laughs> that she wanted to she even even tells him that but for some reason she just kind of keeps stringing him along and i'm i think that it's very interesting um they're even kind of you know in that final uh scene of those two together as he pulls her into i don't know that that building or whatever um they're on on ferrix so you don't really know like if she sees this <laughs> like like admirably in him or if she still sees him as like this pawn that she's going to be able to play uh to further her own career and it, it's really kind of an interesting uh dynamic that they still have uh at yeah. the very end of this that i'm really really interested to see how that plays out if it's going to be some sort of more uh you know kind of like mutually beneficial uh partnership uh romance could romance be in the cards? yeah I don't, exactly i don't, I don't exactly. know for sure or is deidre totally just gonna gonna string this guy along and just crush him at some point which i think is also you know as likely uh as <laughs> as the uh the love side but i'm way interested uh to find out uh more more about that and you know what happens you know after they uh get off of ferrix but uh cassia what do you think about uh about these two um, and the the imperial uh, love affair that we all saw coming. <laughs> oh wow! Um, <laughs> who knows? Um, it could it could be like a, they use each other, or maybe um, it could go a different way. But it just made me kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, and. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'm, just this show, uh, has some great, uh, relationships, like, you have Perrin and Mon Mothma, like, totally, they're so ill-suited, and then you have, like, some beautiful relationships, uh, that you see, like, between, between the rebels, and then, uh, kind of the selfless love that, uh, Cassian uh, shows others and and Bix, you know, and then you have like I don't know what this is between Cyril and Deidre, but it's <laughs> there. So uh, the writers uh, they have Will a lot they? of range. Won't they? I you know? Yeah, I, say, I think it's really interesting that they didn't just create the beautiful relationships inside the Rebel Alliance. But we also got a really toxic relationship uh, with Perrin and Mon Mothma. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really relatable. Uh, people being trapped inside of marriages of convenience for different reasons, for family expect expectations or money-related um, reasons. Um, and I think it's a very universal theme uh, that is so interesting to talk about. And... Uh, you can also look at the different relationships that are good and the way they function and learn from them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we're probably going to see more of that as the show progresses, for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it, 
it's definitely different, um, I think, because when I think of Star Wars, you know, you, we always we talk about like like these trios of characters or like these groups of characters that are friends and allies, and you know, they all pile on to the Millennium Falcon and go to the next destination, and uh, you know, do that. Um, but this this story is very different because you have a lot of individual relationships, but I wouldn't say that you know, kind of beyond like those, you have very very few kind of like like friend sort of dynamics you have you know a little bit with andor um and um you know bix we don't know exactly uh, what the whole story is there but uh, has the friend in brasso um you know he has the relationship with his mother um but you know luthan doesn't really have any any sort of relationships my mothma has has a relationship with you know her her husband and daughter but it's it's this stressful fractured thing um you have Deidre and Cyril's relationship that you don't know what it is what it what it means you don't have you know you don't have like these big like groups of companions like they're all very you know very individual very personal um you know you have um uh Cinta and Vel uh their relationship you know so you have kind of these pairs of people um mm-hmm. you know and they're just kind of you know, tossed into this, <laughs> into this place altogether, and to see how, like those small relationships are going to impact, you know, other small relationships and how they weave in and out of each other is is very different feeling, uh, to me than other Star Wars, you know, kind of family and found family dynamics that we've had before. Yeah, for sure. And can I also like comment on Luthen and his um, quotes, or rather his when he's kind of rebuking Lonnie. Uh, Mm -hmm. in episode 10 Mm -hmm. I love it so much Uh, when he asks him what have you sacrificed calm kindness kinship love given up inner peace made my mind a sunless space Uh, I'm damned for what I do I'm damned oh my gosh I'm damned for what I do my anger my ego my unwillingness to yield my eagerness to fight it set me on a path from which there is no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. Wow. That was just so profound. Loved it. Great writing. It was, yeah, it was really profound. It was really great writing. Obviously, it's uh, great acting. Still in uh, Skarsgård, yeah. uh, Yay. delivering, delivering that. Yeah, I was uh, Matilda. Who's who's your favorite Skarsgård? There's a lot of Skarsgårds. That's a very good question, but I probably think it's Stellan. Yeah, Stellan. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. He's and the goat. It, he's he is the goat for sure. Um, and it's yeah, it's amazing. And and there's this this split second, you know, when when you're on the elevator uh, with. Um, Lonnie, um, you know, he asked him what he sacrificed and you don't know how he's going to answer, <laughs> no. right? You're, you're with Lonnie. You're like, what has this guy sacrificed? I don't yeah, know. Exactly. I don't know how he's going to, is he going to like lash out? Is he going to laugh it off? Is he going to, but no, he digs down and it's, you know, something this, this ultimately, uh, serious thing, which is, you know, beautiful and, and breathtaking and, uh, saddening, um, all at the same time. And I think, I think kind of, you know, as we talk about, you know, different characters, story arcs and uh, heroes journeys that they're on, I think Luthen is at this place that Mon Mothma and Cassie and Andor are kind of catching up to yeah. um, throughout the series, which I which I find interesting. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about I know, um, the that last kind of section in, in Ferrix. We talked about, you know, kind of Mon Mothma, Luthen. Uh, we talked about the, the Empire. But what about the people... Um, on Ferrix, uh, you have the marching band playing Andor's theme, walking through town, which is uh, probably the most uh, staggering <laughs> thing that I've seen on TV in a long time. I mm-hmm. thought it was just absolutely brilliant and, and yeah. beautiful um, the way that the the town is coming together. But um, let's start. Uh, let's start with you, Cassia. What were your your thoughts? I guess just you know, kind of focusing in just on what we saw uh, in Ferrix with kind of the funeral procession and uh, the way that the the rebellion uh, found its place on Ferrix. It was an intense uh, funeral procession, and um, I can see uh, why they chose the actress they did. Uh, I was kind of like, oh, they just killed her off, and I was kind of joking with you, and I'm like, well, I guess they can't... uh, 
afford British thespians, but I'm glad, like, she got uh, one more speech uh, mm-hmm. when she was uh, kind of that massive hologram. But I was kind of surprised, like, was it just playing live and the Empire didn't watch it beforehand, so they didn't know it? W- she was going to say, fight the Empire? And I was like, huh, like, I guess, like, whoever it was the their job to kind of make sure it was all um, okay, you know, according to the Imperial guidelines, you know, they, they didn't do that. But um, it was an intense funeral, and I think, like when someone resists it makes it easier for other people to resist you know and mm-hmm. um i don't know cuz like sometimes it feels like things are going to be just the way they are but how can things change like on a massive scale for good you know it's something i think about uh kind of like in our present day, you know, and just, it's interesting to see it in fiction, you know, and Mm -hmm. stories can inspire people, you know, so, uh, we're supposed to want to fight against the Empire, you know, and what is the Empire, so... It just left me with a lot of questions, and uh, I was just thinking a lot, and uh, thinking about life, and uh, I think that's what good fiction does. Yeah, absolutely. It it definitely uh, does make you think uh, there. Um, And you brought up a really good point, Cassia, is, you know, the the Empire and the Rebellion and kind of those ideas are... (sighs) You know, you have some outliers out there, but uh, but those ideas are too big for the average person, right? You you look at it and you're like, well, there's nothing I can do. And I think that's kind of one of the beautiful things is, um, you know, kind of that manifesto is playing over the background of it. Um, obviously, you have uh, Marva uh, speech uh, played by Fiona Shaw, who is awesome um, in the series being projected by B2. Uh, that guy comes in and flips over B2. That's the worst guy. Oh, man. That's, that's like the second worst guy after Perrin. Maybe they're <laughs> tied for they're tied for worst guys. It was so sad. I hated that. Um, but yeah, you have you need you need kind of like like a group of of people, I guess, to sort of, to, to take charge. Because if you look at it yourself, I, there's nothing I can do, but maybe there's something that we can do. Um, and that finally came to a head, I think. So, uh, Matilda, let's, uh, let's toss it over to you, uh, Ferrix and the funeral, uh, procession and, uh, that, and sort of this, uh, kind of culmination, uh, here at the end of this, uh, first season. what did you think? Yeah, I was thinking about the hologram. Um, and I think, As we've seen, uh, there's been a gradual increase of imperial presence on the planet. So I think from the beginning, the the Empire doesn't care about Ferrix. They don't have to care um, at all, as they say. They're just, you know, one one little piece of a big puzzle. Um, But now, as we've seen, you know, Andor as the central character being being, having an an inhabitant of Ferrix for so long, the the eyes of the empire, uh, they are on Ferrix, and I guess from this day on they're gonna realize they they cannot be sloppy anymore and they have to check <laughs> whatever's gonna be uh, projected or uh, whatever speech is gonna be held um, beforehand, because otherwise, or I, I I'm just thinking maybe they did not didn't know they're gonna play a speech. They usually don't mm-hmm. do that. Um, it was just an extraordinary occasion. Um, I was also thinking about uh, uh, oh, the older generation passing on the torch with Marva's speech. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that is that's something that's happening a lot. Um, I see a lot of older people speaking up about different issues, um, kind of helping. Uh, reminding the younger generations about the fact that they can do something, they can make a difference. And also seeing young people rising up, 
Um, I think that uh, my empire right now is probably the whole climate change situation that we mentioned before we started this talk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about our wonderful Greta here in Sweden, a young girl who started at 15 to speak up against the big world leaders and urging them to, to action, to do something, that, that it isn't too late for us to act, to make a change. But because of the greed of you know, big corporations, uh, politicians, not much is happening, or at least not much of significance. Um, but then also knowing that even if we have to speak up against the big corporations, each of us can do something little, uh, change our lifestyles in order to uh, make the world better, in order to slow down the effects of global warming. Um, we're, we're not helpless. It's not too late. We can do something. That's what I thought about when I watched this. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I love this, this series before this episode, but by this time when I'd heard Lufus quotes and, uh, Marva's speech and also Nemec's manifesto, I was just, yeah. This is it. This is the best Star Wars I've ever seen. Um, yeah. So, at least when it comes to the writing, for sure. Mm -hmm. It was, it's, it's profound. It's rooted in our world and it will leave you, it will provoke you. It's provocative. It's not going to make you comfortable. It's not going to make you go to bed and feel like, I so, feel so good about myself and about the world. It's going to make you go, nah, we got to do something. I can't be mm -hmm. lazy lazy button anymore um and i think that's the beauty of this series so many great messages and themes about sacrifice about the fact that if you want change if you want something to change if you want to uproot the system you got to make some uncomfortable sacrifices it's going to cost you a lot but it's going to be worth it in the long run mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um you, you make a, a really good point, you know, kind of in, in the parallel to, to the real world and, you know, things and issues that we see, um, you know, with our, within our own communities and, you know, the, the broader world and, you know, there's, there's things to do and there's definitely some inspiration there. But one of the things I thought was interesting about this, we know we're getting another season and we kind of know ultimately where the, where the story ends up, but we're really left at the end of the series without, without any heroes, right? We had, we have yeah. Nemec's, Nemec's manifesto, but you know we lose Nemec. We have um, Kino Loy, who led the the prison escape. Um, you know he's a hero, but you know didn't make didn't make it out of out of the escape. We have Marva in her beautiful, uh, compelling speech that she gives. You yeah. know plus plus you know several other nuggets that she imparts to to Cassian along the way. Um, you, know, you know, but she's not with us anymore. So really, we're we're left with you know with Andor, with with Luthen, with Ma Mothma, with um, you know bix and brasso and and who are these people going to be now that this series is over and um you know obviously we know we know what andor is going to do in my mothma but you know who, who are these other people are they going to take inspiration are they going to uh, rise up and and be heroes and and be leaders and i just i thought that it was uh so so beautifully done and in, in the way that it was uh written and the way that it that looked and the way that it made me feel um and you know the way that it made me feel you know waiting week to week to see uh where the story went so that's kind of in a nutshell we just ran through the arcs you know a little bit pretty quickly you know we we skimmed over those quite a bit because there was a lot to get through but i want to before we wrap up the show i just kind of want to go around and just give some you know overall um impressions of the show things that we liked you know if there were any things that we we didn't necessarily like as much or uh, just what your general general kind of thoughts were so cassie let's start with with you, we've gotten to see twelve episodes of Andor now. Now we have to wait like two years until oh we see boy. some more, which is which is sad <laughs> and terrible. Not as sad as little B two getting tossed over, but you know, still oh. pretty sad. Still pretty sad. But but what were your what were your final takeaways? You know, closing thoughts, closing praise, or uh, you know, uh, what have you? I mean, here is my review of Andor. Uh, the first season of Andor is incredible. This show deserves more eyes. This is mm -hmm. Star Wars you don't have to hype yourself up for. It's just solid all around. And um, 
I think the only weak link in my mind is it kind of seems like uh, Cassian was looking for his sister only in like the first uh, episode, you know, um, and then it kind of mm -hmm. seemed like it that point was kind of dropped. Um, I would like to, I don't know if they pick that up in the second season, that would be nice, but, um, uh, like you guys were saying, like, this is, like, written incredibly well, um, there, there really aren't any weak performances, weak episodes, filler, you know, it all kind of, like, adds up to, to something, um, so, Andor is my favorite, um, uh, Disney Plus show, and, like, it's, it's kind of up there with some of the movies, honestly, so. Yeah, there you go, excellent, yeah, excellent, excellent review, I like, uh, a lot of that, so, uh, Matilda, let's, uh, let's toss it over to you, any, any closing thoughts or any sort of other... Any things you wanted to highlight from the show that you think are, are worth mentioning and uh, talking about? But uh, take it away. Yeah, the, the, the acting, the casting, the, the acting performances, they were just solid and brilliant all the way through. Um, especially Stellan Skarsgård and uh, Cassian and or, or I mean... Diego Luna, of course, and uh, Andy Serkis were just a few really big gold nuggets. And also, what's her name? Uh, Genevieve O'Reilly. Um, it was so well cast. I felt every single emotion um, in, the, in the storytelling added to that with its dialogue and the speeches. It was just perfection. Um, I can't find many flaws in it at all actually um i love the the real sets um the cgi used kind of sparingly in places at least in the background it was not like in the foreground that much mostly um practical effects and real sets uh it was beautiful and um uh, yeah like i said before a world lived in that you would like to maybe you probably want to be wouldn't want to be part of this era because it's so problematic and tumultuous but you would definitely want to experience these planets uh, like you said the iceland one uh, the english one etc um the only point where i felt i was not as on board was probably in episode 11 for some reason mm -hmm. i found myself kind of uh, zoning out a little bit in a few moments um, but I think it was just because there was so much going on in the other episodes so all of a sudden it was a little bit slower and so uh, it didn't capture my attention as much but otherwise a beautiful compelling story um, memorable characters crazy good music mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and be beautiful stunning visuals I have so many good things to say about this series um, I could just keep on going on and on and on. Yeah, it, it's it's the goat. <laughs> it is. It is the goat. It is. It's so uh, excellent. Um, you know, uh, we we talked a lot about the about the show and you know, kind of the characters and and their arcs and yeah. I mean, ultimately, this show comes together so well because the the writing is so good. Like it, it's, it's phenomenal. Like it blows you away, especially when you think you're taking, taking a story that you ultimately know the end of, right? We know, uh, Cassian Andor, uh, dies stealing the Death Star plans. We know Ma Mothma goes on to lead the Rebel Alliance. We know that we know where these characters are going. So to make us feel so interested and invested. connected to and invested, um, in these other characters is, is just a, a staggering, uh, feet and you know this is this is no small cast yet you know uh, depending on how good I do on editing you'll probably notice that I stumbled on uh, several of these names because the cast yeah. is <laughs> is very bit is very big there are a lot of a lot of new characters um, new locations all of this stuff to take in and you felt you know you felt an emotional uh, connection or attachment or hatred yeah. uh, towards towards these characters you know all the way from the start um, if I had uh, 
I don't. It's, it's not even a, not even a negative. But I will say when I watch when I watch the first episode, I'm like, all right, this this was excellent. This looks great. Um, I really like these characters. I, I like all the stuff. Everything that I just watched on my TV was was great. That was a really great episode of television. But I don't know if that's like a Star Wars to me uh, because it's so very different than the mm-hmm. Star Wars that we've gotten. Um, but you know as as the the series progressed and you know really it didn't even take me uh very long to kind of wrap my head around that that's this this is a star wars um it's just it's a very different tale um and i think that that could kind of throw some people off obviously this is not geared towards kids which is you know your general uh, kind of star wars audience i was just visiting some some family for the thanksgiving holiday here in here in the u.s and my nephew obviously wasn't wasn't watching this you know normally we we get together and we talk about all the all the star wars but this was this was star wars just for you know me and my my brother-in-law it wasn't for my nephew uh not yet at least anyways so um so that there is there is that i guess but i think that that's okay because you know in a in a world you know if we're if we're paralleling the star wars world to the to the real world um which is something that 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 we like to do just justified or not um you know there there's room for different stories and some stories are bleak some are joyous some are um inspiring uh you know and i i think that there's room for all of these different stories which i think is uh really great and you know this this show hands down is the, the the best written uh you know possibly the best looking um uh, show that we've gotten you know especially of the tv shows and uh, as a tv show the series works so well because you know you don't get to explore the depths of these characters this way in a film um you know and you really get to dial in on these smaller stories uh you know Ro- rogue one was an excellent uh film for that because it was telling kind of this one encapsulated story but to you know breathe life into the rebellion you know it needs some some room to grow um Matilda, I'm glad that you brought up the music because Nicholas Bertel uh, did an incredible job. The music is probably my favorite part of the show mm-hmm. and a show that I have a lot of favorite parts of. The music is so good. Um, I feel like this is a soundtrack that I'll just put on and listen to uh, a lot, uh, which is not something that I always do with Star Wars music. Star Wars music is always really good, and it's really good for the film. But I feel like this, kind of like the show of Andor, um, you know, also is almost like transcendental of <laughs> of being star wars like it's it's almost yeah. like on this like next tier of a of a thing and nicholas Patel's music was was absolutely great um got a new droid to love b2 i have him here on my desk right now uh rolling around he's super cute uh awesome uh definitely uh very emotional uh cassia you uh liken him to like the family dog who kind of witnessed the the passing and and the tragedy of this family um, and you know, you get into that, that final arc when, you know, he's just not comprehending that, that Marva is gone and it just breaks your heart and it makes you cry and, uh, very sad stuff. Um, and the show is a lot of, a lot of sad stuff, but you know, ultimately there are moments of inspiration there and it does a really good job of setting us up, I think for the second season to see where these characters go, how they evolve and, you know, what gets us into, uh, the rebel Alliance that we've uh, known and loved since nineteen. 19- uh, 77. So uh, that's kind of my uh, spiel on it there. Do, do either of you have any closing thoughts or any other things that we want to mention before we uh, get this one wrapped up? I think we nailed it, you know. Yeah. yeah. With this episode. So. <laughs> uh, Cassia, that was that was excellent. Andor was an excellent series. I'm glad we uh, got a chance to talk about it. And Matilda, I'm glad you uh, were able to come back and talk about it with us. I've been loving reading kind of your um, little you know episode kind of snippet to break down, uh, review things that you're putting up on your Instagram. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more uh, about yourself? Uh, you know, if they're not familiar with you from Instagram or if they hadn't listened to the the Book of Boba Fett episode, uh, you came and joined us on. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit uh, about about yourself and what you've got going on on the uh, Swedish Jedi page there. Yeah, so for my as my daily job, I'm an English and Spanish teacher, and that's where my language interest comes from. And I also became a passionate Star Wars fan from 2015 and onwards. I already loved the movies before, uh, but then in 2019, just before the the pandemic hit, I was really started to get really invested in the community, uh, which I hadn't been before. And then onwards, I have been writing P2 
pieces about different aspects of Star Wars. Uh, a lot of sequels related stuff, but then since we've gotten so much more new content, I've been doing reviews, uh, silly little comedic things and uh, commentaries, uh, parallels with different themes. I like to compare Star Wars um, or find elements in Star Wars of feminism, of uh, racism and other themes. I, I think I talked about uh, the whole deep faking uh, controversy after the Book of Boba Fett, uh, which was really interesting, an interesting discussion. I really like to find different angles uh, on Star Wars and discuss it. So that's what I do. And you got to invest yourself a little bit in my texts uh, because they're pretty longish for Instagram, but I find that people do and I love that. I'm so grateful for it. Yeah, absolutely. Your uh, your Instagram page is a uh, great follow if you want to do any more, uh, you know, kind of more analytical uh, thinking about uh, the way that, you know, the Star Wars series and shows and movies are going. And uh, yeah, there's uh, some lighthearted fun in there, too. So definitely make sure you're following uh, the Swedish Jedi uh, if you're on Instagram. So uh, I don't know, Cassie, I think that that is going to wrap it up for our discussion on Andor. Um, you know, we've we've sung its praises uh, long enough, I think, for one episode. And there's, you know, plenty of other uh, really great podcasts that have been covering, you know, the series kind of week to week. But, you know, we wanted we wanted to take in the whole show, bring on an expert uh, and Matilda to talk about it with us and i think we did uh did a pretty admirable job i would say b2 would be proud of us mm -hmm. uh b2 emo uh may he not be knocked over anyway. yeah <laughs> yeah may he not be knocked over it would be hard to knock him over he has quite the wide base i will say so yeah um yeah, I guess that guy was really mad to do it. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how their story picks up uh, in the future. And thank you so much for tuning in uh, to this one. Let us know what you thought about the series uh, and or if you watched it, if you're going to go back and rewatch it. And uh, let us know if you think it's going to win any awards, because hopefully it at least gets some nominations and gets some more eyes on it, because it's definitely deserving of that. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And may the force be with you. May the force be with you. More kraft var med dig.